This talk is entitled, What My Haitian Parents Taught Me About Resilience. Now, resilience is defined as the capability to overcome adversity and adjust over obstacles. But before we talk about resilience in full, let me paint the picture just a little bit. See, I'm going to take you to Jamaica, Queens, New York City. It's the mid to early 1980s. Hip-hop is still a burgeoning culture, cultural phenomenon looking to grow. The, the, the crack epidemic is still killing and crushing black and brown communities. People are rocking gold chains and Timberland boots and bubble coats, getting them at the Coliseum Mall. See, that was the staple of Jamaica, Queens, New York City. In my apartment, it was a little bit different, though. In my apartment, this was Young Jeff. And see, young Jeff lived with two Haitian immigrant parents. And inside of that household, instead of hip-hop, we were listening to compa music, which is Haitian music. Listening to bands like Skasha Number no. 1 and Tabu Combo. Trust me, you should check them out. We were eating Haitian foods. We were living the Haitian culture within this home. When I talk about Haitian foods, I mean, I'm talking about Rio. I'm talking about Mai Moulet. I'm talking about D.I. John John. See, if you don't know those, it's okay. Go, go look it up and get yourself some tasty Haitian food. See, in those apartments, in that apartment, I also learned about the ancient tradition of storytelling. See, there's this phrase. It's called Crick and Crack. And this storytelling tradition essentially is a call and response. So what it does is it allows the storyteller to say the word creek and then the audience they would say crack and when they say crack that would elicit me the storyteller to tell the story. So I'm going to try that with you. Is that cool with everyone? Yes. Yeah. Sure? Is that cool with everyone? Yeah. yeah. Alright. So let's try it. Creek. Crack. Alright that was pretty good. Let's try it one more time. Creek. Crack. Excellent. See, it's January 1st, 1804. Haiti has defeated Napoleon's great army to become the first successful slave revolution in the history of this world. And see, growing up in that same apartment, on some days it was my mom, my dad, my sister and I, and sometimes it was five or six or seven or eight other people living in their one bedroom apartment at one time. But there were these four pictures that I saw on a regular basis every single day. That was Toussaint Louverture, that was Jean-Jacques Dessalines, that was Henri Christophe, and that was Alexandre Péchon. These four men are identified as the forefathers of the Haitian Revolution. Now, the reason why this and resilience have something to do with each other is because my parents constantly told me about the history of revolution. And sometimes what we don't recognize is the difficulty, the process, the years, the energy, the perseverance, the determination that it takes to succeed as a revolting nation, as a person who believes in revolution, who says, get you off of my back because I want freedom instead of your foot upon my neck. See, that is not just revolution, that is resilience. When we speak about resilience and revolution, they go hand in hand. And as a young man, the first images that I saw, the things that I knew the most, were these four men and their stories of how they impacted and changed the world. See, I don't know what you know Haiti to be known as, but I know Haiti as that revolutionary country that not only shaped Haiti itself, but shaped South America and the Caribbean and right here in these United States. You can thank these Haitian revolutionary men and their families and their people and their communities for so much freedoms around the world. So I learned about resilience by learning about the Haitian Revolution. <coughs> Let me tell another story. Creek! Crack! Creek! Crack! So I told y'all about the food before. <laughs> Sunday mornings, my mother would wake up and she would have this giant pot. And inside of that pot, there would be some squash, some beef, some pasta, some spaghetti, some carrots, and all other mixes, potatoes, all of the goodness. And every Sunday, my mom would make this amazing soup. And I couldn't wait to eat it. 
Because that soup not only represented a delicious meal, it also represented my grandma might be eating soup with me today. Or cousins might be coming over to the apartment to enjoy the soup with us. Or aunts and uncles would come enjoy the soup together as a family. There was a joy that came with that soup. Now let me tell you about the history of soup jumu, because that's what it's called. Soup jumu is part of that Haitian revolution that we just discussed. The once enslaved people were not allowed to drink soup jumu. And then they became free. And part of their celebration was enjoying the soup together as a people, as a free people. And today, all across the world, Haitians alike celebrate January 1st, 1804, as not only the revolution, but we celebrate because we're drinking that soup jumu together. We're drinking it as a community. We're drinking it as a people. We're having fun with one another. We're telling jokes. Let me tell you about resilience connected to that soup jumu. See, resilience is also joy. Sometimes resilience is identified as simply the struggle. But see, resilience is also the beauty. Resilience is saying we can do this as a community. Resilience is saying that we are going to survive and struggle, but we are going to enjoy each other's time. Joy is resilience. See, joy has already been identified as a psychological factor that impacts how we deal with stress. How many of us have had to deal with stress with that one moment of joy with our family, with our friends, eating our favorite meal, hanging out with our favorite people has changed our day, our moment, our lives. Joy is part of resilience. So when I drink that soup, and let me just let y'all know, I, I make a mean soup jumu myself. <laughs> So when we start talking about community and joy, if you want a community and joy with me, come find my recipe afterwards and I got y'all. Let's eat this soup jumu together. Let's enjoy this joy together. Let me tell another story. Crick! Crack! Crick! Crack! April 20th, 1990. My father walks into the room and says, it's time to go. I said, where are we going? He said, we're heading to the Brooklyn Bridge. And I said, for what? He said, because we do not stand in the face of racism and injustice and just allow it to be. So let me tell you the background behind that. The Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, identified that HIV and AIDS was being spread across the country by four individual groups. They called it the four H's. They said homosexuals, hemophiliacs, heroin addicts, and Haitians were the reason that HIV was running rampant in the United States of America. It was such a bad thing that Haitians couldn't donate blood to help anybody. It was an issue where people started to say, whether I was in school or whether in your neighborhood, if you were Haitian, you must have HIV. But we see, there's a little thing called science and research that told us otherwise. And we knew that. But before even understanding or having conversations about science or research, we're revolutionaries. We are built in resilience. So my father woke me up, my sister, my mom, my grandma, we all traveled from Jamaica, Queens, New York City to Brooklyn. And we walked across that Brooklyn Bridge deep, letting people know that you just can't call us by our names, outside of our names. You just can't walk around here calling us anything you want. You better get your facts straight. We're going to call you out for your racism. We're going to call you out for your injustice. We're going to call you out for your bigotry. Because see, as a Haitian people, we are resilient as well. And see, if the news tells it, I think her name was Sue Simmons from our veterans back in the day. Sue Simmons reported that there was 15,000 Haitians on the bridge that day that decided to shut down New York City and Brooklyn. But the real story will let you know that the actual number was closer to 150,000 people on all sides of the Brooklyn Bridge, letting people know that we are proud of who we are, that we are proud of our blood, that we do not stand with the racism. See, resilience is also saying, I don't care that you call me outside of my name. 
you are going to learn how to say it correctly. In the same vein, that if you can learn how to say Schwarzenegger, then you're going to have to learn how to say my Haitian last name too. See, that's the thing about resilience. We just don't just sit down and stand for anything. Resilience is about saying, I'm proud of who I am. That's how you overcome that adversity. It's saying, I'm proud of where I came from. That's how you push through through that struggle. See, I'll never forget, I was about eight years old at the time, marching across that bridge. And it is something that has stuck with me till this day. So as I sit back and have conversations about protests and have conversations about injustice, I let people know I was eight years old talking about that because of the resiliency that my parents were teaching me at a young age. It doesn't start when you're 50 or 40 or 30. It starts when you're five, six, seven, eight years old. I got another one for you. Creek. Creek. These are my parents. Andrea de Sous and Jacques de Sous. They came to the United States in the early 1970s. English wasn't their first, second, or third language. They had very little money in their back pockets. They had very little family members here in the United States. But they knew that coming to this country was going to lead to a better position for them and their families. And see, I think about the struggle that they had to go through. And they, to me, are the definition of resilience. Because I'll tell you, in those 1970s eras, not only did they have to deal with those particular struggles of racism and poverty, but they said, we're going to fight through it. So, you know, I'm, I'm proud to say this. Both of my parents said, we're going to find jobs and multiple jobs and we're going to work through it. Then both of my parents said, we're going to go to college because we have figured out that a college degree is something that's going to enhance our livelihoods. So both of my parents said, we're going to go and get an associate's degree at Queensboro Community College. And then they followed up that associate's degree and they both got bachelor's degrees from your college in Queens, New York. And I'm going to name them because it's important for you to understand that traveling process that my parents had to go through. My dad eventually got his master's degree at Adelphi University. My parents see, sometimes people think about students and children who are children of immigrants and say, well, you must be a first generation college student, Jeff. I mean, somebody, you must be the first person in your family to go to college. Well, I don't know that you know I wasn't. My sister went before me and both of my parents, immigrants from Haiti, had college degrees before I even stepped foot into a college classroom. But let's talk about resilience and education together. See, they walked into those classrooms, stepped into those spaces, and people treated them differently because they didn't have the language at hand, because they had a little bit of an accent, because you know what my dad was saying? At lunch, I'm going to class. My mom said, at night, I'm going to class. We're going to figure out how to get these degrees no matter how long and how much it takes, and they did. And they taught me that same type of resiliency and perseverance on a day-to-day -day basis. Sometimes I'd go back to my mom and say, I can't do math homework today because my pencil broke. I would break the pencil on purpose. <laughs> and I know we didn't have a pencil sharpener in hand, so I said, you know what? We're not doing math tonight. But then my mom would pull out a knife. And she would take that broken pencil and she would start sharpening it right there. And I know that pencil is a little weird, but she said, You can now do your math homework, son. So she taught me resilience in more ways than one. The educational process, I'm sitting here at a college, at a university, because this is higher education. And sometimes higher education is limiting to people who don't have the resources. It's limiting to people who don't have advantages. It's limiting to people who don't know before them. But I'm letting you know whether you're a high school student, whether you're a college student, whether you're an administrator, whether you're a family member, we all have the opportunity because Jacques and Andrea de Jesus have shown me the way. They have taught me the way of resiliency. And today, I got to say, I am a father, I am a husband, and I am a proud Haitian man who's married to a beautiful, brilliant, proud Haitian woman. And together, we have a beautiful, precocious, doesn't go to sleep, <laughs> amazing Haitian son. 
So my Haitian parents taught me all about the resiliency to be the person that I am today. And you better believe I'm going to teach that young man the very same thing. Thank you very much.